Welcome to the Epic Flight Academy commercial pilot course. Remember our three keys to success and please hit that subscribe button. Our topic today is night pre-flight and equipment, nighttime considerations and hypoxia at night. Now to help us understand and make sense of this topic, we are going to reference the AFH, that's the Airplane Flying Handbook, and the AIM or Aeronautical Information Manual. When conducting a pre-flight at night, the items that we ins inspect on the pre-flight stay the same, but the technique we use will differ slightly. Well, first of all, we must let our eyes adjust to nighttime vision as discussed in a previous video. Secondly, our technique of pre-flighting changes because, well, we will only be able to see clearly what it is that we shine our light directly on. Now, other items to note. Number one, check flashlight batteries. Number two, pay more attention to the weather at night. Number three, flying VFR, we're going to need to use lighted checkpoints in planning our cross-country checkpoints. Number four, always back up your course with nav aids if possible. Number five, inspect the aircraft lights for proper operation. Number six, don't drain the battery during pre-flight. And number seven, review the night operation FARs. When planning a flight at night, there is a specific equipment that is required. We will find this called out in FAR 91205C, as in Charlie. Required equipment includes, number one, instrument and equipment specified in paragraph B, as in Bravo, of 91205, number two, approved position lights, number three, an approved aviation red or aviation white anti-collision light system. Number four, if operated for hire, an electric landing light. Number five, an adequate source of electrical energy for all installed electrical and radio equipment. And number six, one spare set of fuses or three spare fuses of each kind used that are accessible to the pilot in flight. In addition to equipment, the pilot should consider several items before flying at night. Now, here is an easy to remember list. Night. N for no tams, I for illusions, G for glide slope, H for how, how do I turn on airport lights, and T for terrain. So let's start with N. Be sure to review all no tams prior to takeoff. I, illusions. Common nighttime illusions include First of all, the false horizon. So distant or stationary lights may look like stars or other aircraft. Over the ocean, stars and boats may merge to create a false horizon. Over the desert, ranch lights and stars can form a new horizon. On dark nights, there may be no visual horizon. The solution? Use our instruments, believe the instruments, and if you have one, turn on the autopilot. Number two, autokinesis. Now this is caused by staring at a single light against a dark background for several seconds. What happens is that light appears to be moving. Well, in fact, it's your eye that's moving. The solution, don't fixate on a single source of light and focus on a variety of objects in other words, in the aircraft, scan. A third night illusion is called flicker vertigo. This is caused by blinking or flickering lights. Some symptoms may include nausea, dizziness, grogginess, headache, confusion. The solution, 
If possible, turn your eyes away or close them. Try to move away from or avoid the blinking lights to the extent that's possible. Now, landing illusions at night. Higher than normal approach. This will be caused by rain, haze, bright lights, steep terrain, and wide runways. These all produce the illusion of being too low that causes us to come in too high. Clouds. We can't see them very well on most nights, so do a thorough pre-flight weather briefing. If lights on the ground are appearing blurry, you are entering fog or clouds. Be mindful of nearby highway lights or other airports. And then finally, the fifth night illusion is called the black hole approach. Now, this illusion is created by approaching from where there are no or very few other visual cues other than the runway lights. So it doesn't mean that I have to be coming over a quarry or a forest or a large body of water, although those are typical. So the pilot has few other visual cues other than the runway. Now, what actually happens in the black hole approach is the pilot tries to maintain a constant visual angle and as a result ends up descending below the glide path and may come up short. So in the upper diagram here, you can see what a normal approach sequence looks like. And you can see the yellow airplane as it moves down the normal glide path the visual angle to the runway changes. Now, in the black hole effect, because there are few other visual cues, the pilot in the yellow airplane, you can see this in the bottom figure, tends to keep the same visual angle to the runway. And if we do that, we end up coming in low or below the glide path, and that's the black hole that we're talking about. Okay, G. G is for glide slope. Always use the Pappies or Vassies or electronic glide slopes. Yes, you can reference these while flying visually. You do not have to be instrument rated to use electronic glide slopes. Discuss this with your flight instructor. Remember, the black hole approach, a constant visual angle does not equal a constant approach angle. So if possible, you wanna use the Pappies or the Vassies and you know if you're at a runway, where these are not available and you're only able to see the runway lights, that's a heads up for us to think about and avoid that black hole. H. H is for lights? Well, yes, because the H, I want you to think about how are you going to control and or turn on the airport lights if needed. Now, for this, you'll need to refer to the chart supplement. And again, review this with your flight instructor. Finally, T. T is for terrain avoidance. As we mentioned earlier, it is harder to see clouds and overcast layers at night. Keep looking out and checking for lights on the ground. Remember, blurry lights or a halo indicate flying into a cloud or fog. Pay particular attention to the MEF or maximum elevation figures on your chart. These indicate the highest elevation, including terrain and vertical obstacles within that particular latitude longitude quadrant. Now, hypoxia. Hypoxia is a concern on any flight, but at night we must be even more vigilant to its dangers. The FAA recommends general aviation aircraft stay below 5,000 feet MSL at nighttime. Well, why is that? 
What changed concerning hypoxia between day and night? Am I more oxygen sensitive after the sun goes down? No. There are two key reasons that we are more concerned with hypoxia at night, and they have to do with the eye. First, light-sensitive rods use more oxygen than our bright daylight vision cone cells do. And there are approximately 92 million rod cells compared to the only 5 million cone cells in the average human eye. So the rods require more oxygen in total. Okay, and secondly, as we know, our vision relies more on the rod cells at night or in low light conditions. So now we are relying upon those rod cells that require more oxygen and there are more of them. So this is why we want to be more vigilant to the effects of hypoxia at night and limit our altitudes to 5,000 MSL unless we're using oxygen. That's right, it's 5,000 MSL, not AGL. Well, folks, today we have reviewed night pre-flight and equipment, nighttime considerations, and hypoxia at night. Join us next time.